My name is Jerry Gill. Today is June 27, 2009. I'm visiting with Alan Redding, former associate director of the Student Union here at Oklahoma State University. Uh, we're in the Student Union on the OSU campus in Stillwater, Oklahoma. And this interview is for the Oklahoma State Stories Project of the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. And Alan, we appreciate you taking time to be with us today. My pleasure. Mm -hmm. I understand there's it's a special day uh, today. It is. Um, mm -hmm. The student union director now is doing a, trying to get a history of the student union together, which we didn't do too well at. We got a lot of scrapbooks, but to get an oral history together mm -hmm. and some ideas about what the beginnings of the union was on this OSU campus. And I think that's really a great project. I'm proud to be part of it. Out of year for 30 some odd, maybe 36 years or so, affiliated with the student union, but I'd like to go back and start maybe at the beginning. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about where you grew up in your early life? Um, I was born in El Reno, Oklahoma, and went to a Catholic school there at Sacred Heart all 12 years of my uh, time, and I graduated in one of 12 people mm -hmm. <laughs> in 1950. Mm -hmm. And then I went to El Reno Junior College, um, now called Redland College, mm -hmm. for two years there, got an AA degree, and then uh, waited around a year with the Army for mm -hmm. A while got out of the army, worked for about a year, and got really bored with what I was doing. So I said, I really need to go back to school. So I came to OSU and started out in architecture, which I really loved, but I couldn't do the math. Math was my <laughs> downfall. I'd like to someday try it again, but anyway, it's a little late now. Um, switched hotel. My roommate was doing all the stuff that I thought was really cool. And he was in hotel and restaurant administration. So I switched schools. And, uh, got a degree in hotel and restaurant administration. And during that time, I got a, my first job at the union was, through other friends in another way, um, got a job at the Student Union Hotel as a bellhop. Mm -hmm. And that was that was very interesting. So um, a bellhop for a while, then I went to the desk clerk for a little while, and didn't make enough money there. I was doing too well at the bellhop. So I went back to bellhopping. And, Got a chance to move over to the food area and into the coffee shop, where as a cook and uh, salad room maker, I would do the cook and all that kind of stuff. And she wound up manager of the coffee shop. And then one day we were sitting there and this guy came up and, from um, Wichita. And he was with um, NST Room. It's interesting. He wanted to know if I'd like to come work for him, interview to work for him. So it turned out we were in Wichita, they were paying $300 a month, which is $100 a month more than I was making here, and we were barely making it. We had a brand new baby. And so we went to Wichita to, for a couple of years, and it was a Macy's store. And when you work for Macy's, you get an education. So I really learned how to, really learned how to run a place when I was in Wichita. But we were spending every other weekend back here in Stillwater visiting friends, and we were visiting Norman Moore, and he said, oh, why don't you come back to Stillwater? You know, come back and work the union, and it took us about 30 seconds to make that decision. So we moved back to Stillwater, and the rest is kind of, kind of history from there. Well, let me ask you, what year did you come back now to work for the student union? Came back in 1964. Okay, and you were at OSU uh, during which years? Uh, I graduated in 1960. 60. Okay, and you came mm -hmm. in 50. And worked in the, worked in the uh, coffee shop mm -hmm. until 62, okay. and then. We, I was gone for two years, February 62, I came back in February 64 as a, uh, they kind of made a place for me. I was, a, was called an administrative assistant <laughs> and I worked in the food area uh, there uh, doing purchasing, can cutting, um, just learning that meat, meat purchasing and all that kind of stuff. And then I eventually kind of worked into more into the food it ended up being food manager uh, for the student union for a couple, three years and, mm -hmm. and made a career decision to get out of food and kind of forced on me by, uh, I was not, my temperament is not for the daily daily grind of a meeting deadlines after deadlines every day. I, I was not good at that. And so they felt sorry for me and let me be mm -hmm. into the big part of the union. <laughs> so. I came over in programs working with Student Union Activities Board, mm -hmm. which turned out, I said, oh my God, I don't know anything about this. Mm -hmm. But it turned out to be one of my favorite, mm -hmm. favorite part of my jobs that I ever worked here because 
have to work with students. We got to, they'd have big ideas and I got to facilitate, you know, we got to figure out how to do those things. And, and uh, we did some big fun programs, you know, you may bring a carnivals in. I don't know if you remember the Ferris wheels and the Tilda Whirls at the Garden Terrace and, and had the Ferris of the Fair and we did all, all kinds of, the funniest one. We had the Sadie Hawkins week. And I, if you remember, nobody's old enough to remember Sadie Hawkins, but that was kind of a little out of the Little Abner cartoon when Sadie Hawkins was always chasing men. So during the Sadie Hawkins week, the women would all ask the guys for dates. And part of that was the pig, grease pig contest. <laughs> and catch a grease pig. Uh, didn't have lipstick. Um, <laughs> but we, the kids went out and they brought a pig from the swine barn out here. And they had a big crowd around Theta Pond. And uh, so they had the grease pig and they, they started the contest and they would run and chase the grease pig and catch it. And, you know, and it was quite a, mm -hmm. quite a deal. <laughs> and somehow I had to be in there and I looked up and here was one of the chairman of the committee. He came in, he just looked awful. He says, guess what? And I said, oh no, the pig died. And he said, yes. I said, oh God, what'd you do? <laughs> what'd you do? He said, we put it in the back of a car and took it away. I says, good. <laughs> and that was the end of that. <laughs> That was kind of one of the funny parts of that week. <laughs> Though, that was kind of, experiences like that are fun, and, and we learned a lot on that. Not to, Then we come to find out that it was a Poland China pig, and the characteristic of a Poland China pig is to have a heart attack when it's scared, mm -hmm. and they die. So it was, <laughs> they gave us some pigs they knew <laughs> that, we, that we didn't know that that would happen. Yeah. It was kind of fun. Anyway, that was, Stories like that. There's a bunch of them that just that we did. So, so Alan, how, how many years were you in charge of student programming and student activities? You know, I have to go back to my personnel stuff, but I think off and on, probably about six or seven years, because mm -hmm. about in the middle of that, then they Ray Sharp left, and I got his conference, his conference job put on top, uh -huh. added to that. Mm -hmm. So I did conferences and student work, mm -hmm. both for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And I did full conferences and then. Well, you, so you kind of worked your way and sort of summarized when you start off as a student worker and you, you worked in the I mean, you'd sling and ash and then you, you worked at the desk and you worked over in the uh, the uh, student union hotel. You right. You hop over there a few years and then you moved into student. I've uh, had the incredible <laughs> luck, I guess, yeah. of um, working at a place. That I worked so many different jobs and stayed on the same place. I mean, this never happens anymore. But I, I just shifted from job to job through the years, through the years and everything in accounting, they were always afraid to let me touch any money. <laughs> so, <laughs> but you got a chance to reinvent yourself sort of in each job, I guess? Each job, right. And I covered a lot of vacations. I worked in building operations and housekeeping and engineers and all that type of thing. And so for a number of years. And, well, Alan, what, what year did you, uh, if I, am I using the title right, become associate director of Steve Union where you had a, a lot of uh, stuff underneath you. What year was that? Do you remember? What what? Then you move into kind of the, the number two position. It was a title associate uh, director of the studio. I had a number of titles, and I'd have to go back to my personnel records to really know when. And I don't remember some of those. Um, I really don't know what years. But I've never. I've, I'm one of these people who's a better number two man than I am number one man. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, there's the pitchers and the catchers, and I was always the catcher, and I was always happy with that. So, so how many years were you in that number two position? You call just about all of them. About all of them. So did you came. Yeah, I think a, a number of them. Yeah, I was always. Uh, did, all the titles changed. You know, the last they called it manager, and, mm -hmm. and they called you know different titles. Mm -hmm. I'd have to go back and really look. I don't really know, and I'm, it's in the personnel records. Mm -hmm. What uh, did you remember? What the, you shared some of the positions you held, but you remember what the major operational units were. Uh, of the student union in different ways and it was the different departments they had, how it was organized and a little bit about the, the management. For example, you know, you it's a little different. It, it changed, it, it was just a total evolution mm -hmm. over periods of time and I think a lot of it uh, depended on the skills of the people that were, you know, how they could handle it and so forth. We didn't have this thing about doing searches until this, the last number of years and um, in some ways that's a good thing, in some ways 
it stifled a lot of the developmental possibilities among staff mm -hmm. in terms of moving from job to job mm -hmm. and learning, getting more depth in your job. Yeah. Yeah. What, uh, a lot of the uh, you know the revenue streams of the student union. Could you share some of those uh, revenue streams and, and, and how that affected the operations of the you know the student union? We were always poor. <laughs> I can remember years, and we after a whole year of operation, we had made maybe four thousand dollars, which is ridiculous. I mean, it's uh, and we divide that up, and you know, if somebody would get a picture for the curtains or something, I mean, it was not very good, and the. The thing there was we had a lot of offices in the building that we were not collecting rent from. We had the, we were paying for the air conditioning and the cleaning and everything. We were not collecting rent. Mm -hmm. And it has been a constant struggle. And finally, I think with the uh, bringing Tom Keyes in from the academic area, who was able to convince the academics areas that we needed rent to actually survive and turning that you know actually collecting for, uh, money for all of the rent that we did for the collecting for the service that we, we were providing and that really turned around and we were uh, we were having profits and we were you know we were borrowing from residence halls for a number of years and now and it, it turned around to the point that we actually were able to loan them some money on occasion so um it was it's quite a turnaround it's quite good and we also, we had used to have lots and lots of employees. You know, I think we had 250, 275 employees back in the quote, good old days. Mm -hmm. And I think they will operate with less than half of that now, and you can't tell any difference. We just have a different style of work. We work, uh, work more, di work differently, and so forth. So, wow. I'm, not, I'm when it comes to numbers, I'm not really a great one because that reading number stuff is not my. I don't know. I don't think you did different responsibilities you had over the years. What did you enjoy the most? You, you talked about student programming, but were there some additional things you enjoyed in your position? Overall, I enjoyed being in a place that was kind of the center of the campus. I enjoyed meeting all the students and the faculty and working with conferences, working with all the different departments on campus. You get to know a lot of people and being able to be, quote, the living room or the meeting place on the campus, I always thought that was our job. That was what we were best at. And we tried to, I tried to do the best to make that, make the student union be that. And I, for a number of years we were, um, I think we still are looked at as, as maybe the center of the campus. And, uh, at least I hope so. <laughs> what, what, what have you enjoyed most about your job, Alan? What, what I enjoy most? I think meeting all the people and so forth. And also, being in a position, uh, we don't know how incredibly lucky, or maybe it's not lucky, but fortunate we were to have the staff that we were big enough to have our own up engineers where we could weld, we could, we had carpenters here, we had an upholstery shop here, we had a great food department. We have a, so anything you could think of, we had our own personnel who could carry it all. Mm -hmm. And if you were creative in one area, you could go down and make your sketch and so forth, and we'd make it. You know, it, uh, so it was it was pretty cool, and uh, that was enjoyable because you could you were seldom stifled by any kind of limits. And so that's I think we a whole staff kind of took advantage of that. And we we grew a lot and we trained a lot of students. And you when you're working with students and so forth, and they are involved in that, you're training you're training them for how to do things and how to create and so forth. It's a pretty, pretty fun. And I wonder, speaking of working with students, can you think of some uh, success stories from students that you work with? You remember them as a student and kind of, you know, wiping your nose for them that turned there's out a, to be pretty successful later? There's a number of those. I think one of the more recent ones is uh, we had homecoming and Mr. Uh, we were walking down the, down the street, you know, with the walk around. Mr. Redding I looked up and here come Jim Carricker. <laughs> and he was with the Halligans, and I thought, that's interesting. So he pulls me and my wife over, and he says, introduced me to the Halligans, because they were just on campus recently. Yeah. And, uh, he credited me with teaching him how to work around here. He gave me a lot more credit, I think, than I deserved. But I think that his, I'm, I'm his name sure. on the housing area over here because of his donation, and he was telling us at that time, he said, well, I just sold the Wyndham Hotels. He had developed the Wyndham Hotels. 
Jim's story with me, would be, he was so nervous. He was, a, by the way, he was an outstanding uh, student. He was scared he wouldn't get a job. He wanted to go to work for, I think it was Sanger Harris. Really bad. But he wanted to work at the department store area. So he was not real happy with the resume. So Jim and I worked out a resume, a bifold resume, and it had his picture. It was orange and black on that front. Had his picture in it. We had everything lined up so you could open it up, see his picture and all this stuff. So we printed 50 of those. The print shop over here it wasn't cheap. And uh, I think he used one of them. He got a job on his first interview. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but I always, I always think it was a good story because he was always totally prepared. And uh, like Kevin Conway, our night manager. Kevin has a, a night manager here. He is, has a transportation company with barges on the Mississippi. And uh, oh, you should have asked. I should have got ready for this. There's a number, Ellison Beasley, you know, went to work for Dishwitch. He was a night manager, married the information desk clerk, and uh, uh, they're retired and living back in Stillwater, by the way. And uh, Doug Forsman, who was with Fire Protection, married one of my, desk, another one of the desk clerks. We got a number of weddings to come from the uh, information desk and staff uh, <laughs> uh, being around. So that was the Birchfields were met, met here. And I think there's quite a few more that, but that was, that's always kind of fun. And they, and they formed their companies and they're, they've all, a lot of them have done extremely well. So. Well, Alan, you worked under uh, Norman Moore. Right. Uh, Winston Shindell. Right. Uh, Tom Keys, right, and did, did you Jerry Rutman. There was another one in there. Okay, and then did, did Abe Hesser. And, and, and did you work with Abe? I Hesser? worked for every. I worked for all but the first one. All, all but Chet Tibbetts. Oh my gosh! And did you work with Mitch? Even then, you retired yet? When Mitch came in five years uh, ago, Mitch came after I was. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, let me sort of take that. Could you tell me a little bit about each one of the directors that you worked with, and can you tell me about their strengths and maybe some stories? I mean, for example, oh, starting with Abe well. Hesser. Well, beginning with Abe. Um, Abe, Abe was legendary, and he, he, he was, he had a reputation that was a little bit sharper than Abe really was. Mm -hmm. Abe was really a superior human being, and, uh, but he had his way, he had his way that things should be run right, mm -hmm. and everything in the student union ran right, or we knew about it, and uh, he, uh, had a lot of, there was a lot of fear of Abe. I don't know that I ever saw him actually fire anybody on the spot, but people didn't stay around long sometimes if they weren't doing what they should be doing. And uh, Abe was a planner. He expected a lot of everybody. I think he got a lot out of everybody. But uh, his, when he walked down the hall, there was quietness. <laughs> um, after Abe was Norman. Let me pause you. Go ahead. Did, 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 tell me, you sure you've got a couple of good Abe Hesser stories. Can you, well, can you share a couple with me? Uh, I don't know if you remember Jack Baker or not. You remember Jack. And Jack was in athletics. So his dad was in athletics, but his son, Jack, oh, okay. Jack Jr., oh, okay. was in the student union. And he, back in those days, he ran the, Jack Jr. was in the hotel. Um, in, in the hotel, and he was a desk clerk. I think at 14 years old or something. And he was really, he was very confident and ran, was able to do it. And but later on, when Jack was uh, had moved over to food, and we were in there, I was food manager. We decided that the hamburgers in the uh, uh, coffee shop there, the hamburgers were getting a little dull. We were tired of eating the same old hamburgers, so we worked up a hamburger. We just changed the hamburger recipe. <laughs> And we gave him more meat, and, you know, bigger meat and a big bun and a little more stuff on it and so forth. And uh, about a week later, Abe called us up to his office and he told us how to make hamburgers. You have <laughs> five ounces of meat, you have one slice of tomato, you have one bun, you have a little piece of lettuce. And he, we, <laughs> but to present, he says, first time I'd ever heard, he says, now watch my lips. <laughs> <laughs> And he told us how to make those things. And <laughs> first time I'd ever heard that expression. I've heard it since then. And he ended up with it <laughs> on the table, you know. 
And we made hamburgers the way, old fashioned way ever since. We're back the old that hamburgers. was a memorable day. Mm -hmm. uh, that was my, probably my most memorable experience of that type. Of, of a, we always got along really well together. Um, I was kind of known for having ideas different than anybody else and so forth. And occasionally, he, and usually if it was a good one, he would support me on that. We did a lot of stuff uh, out of the blue projects that I thought would work and we improved things. And so I've got a number of little spots around the union that uh, show that. He was a very, he would support you to the, you know, also in terms of the student union, Abe was uh, brought it was a one of the founders of AC, not only he was a founder, but he was one of the powers in ACUI, Associated College Unions International. And on the bronze plaque out here in front of the office, he donated that. But the year that they developed that state role statement, Abe was um, president of ACUI. And later on, he, de he donated the plaque out here so we could always remember what we were about. And so uh, he brought in for his conferences here, he would bring in the top people from around the country, uh, from student union, but we got, as, and have st with our staff. So we were indoctrinated with national figures for what a student union should be from early on. And so that was quite impressive. So, Norman Moore. Norman Moore, I probably shouldn't say this on camera, camera he's still living. <laughs> <laughs> was interesting. Uh, Norman and I, we got along real well. Uh, <clears throat> he was a good, he was a good, good manager. But Norman would, had a management style that just drove you nuts. He would give you this problem, and then he would sit around and wait till you came up with his answer. <laughs> and sometimes it took us a long time to figure out what he wanted. <laughs> and uh, so that, that's kind of Norman, but Norman did a lot of, Norman was a very good person to work with. We, our kids all kind of grew up together, and we were family in and out of the union both. So, and the number of the staff were. We all lived on the north side of town, and our kids all were about the same age. So we, we did quite a bit. He had four girls, which I thought would have been incredible. Anyway, <laughs> what is some favorite uh, Norman Moore stories? No, you know, really, I really don't. We just we were, we were pretty. Um, Norman was a frustrated artist, and I think, and he, he enjoyed, you know, doing design work and this type of thing. So we got, we got along fine. He, what do you think he brought, uh, what, if you talk about his legacy, what did he bring to the student union? Hmm. Well, he was pretty stable, and he was student. As, as Abe was, Abe was always come down on the side of the students, and he was very good about that. And I think Norman did, did a very good job. Some of those years were so, in the 70s, we had a lot of campus unrest. It's hard to remember back, it's hard to think about how it really was back then, but it was pretty hairy for a while. And I think Norman, we went through some of those pretty well because of the calm leadership. So, Winston Shindell. Winston Shindell. Oh, Lord. Well, we had uh, we had Rutman in there, been between one of those, oh, okay. and he was the one we'd probably rather forget. And if, if he hears this, he'll know I mean it. No, <laughs> uh, Rutman was an interesting character, and we didn't realize at the time that this guy was probably I would I would say if we in today's world he would be called a multiple personality, and we didn't know at the time, but he was he was kind of a his leadership style was pretty this way and that way. Uh, he had a good staff meeting, and he let us do a lot of things. He encouraged creativity, which was good. He had a lot of good points too, because he was he was one of the reasons I got to move around a little bit and flex, but in which I learned a lot, which made me. But uh, he was hard to get along with and mysterious in a lot of ways. You glad to see Winston come on board then. So Winston came on, and that was good. He he was in student activities, and so he was familiar with all of us. And Winston was in student activities, so the student aspect of that, mm -hmm. of the student union, was very nicely moved in, mm -hmm. and so it, it enhanced. 
both student activities and the student union when he came in. Winston was pretty creative and worked hard, and we got a lot, we did quite a few changes when he was here in development. And over the years, we've been talking about the different leaderships and the different directors, and you were here 36 years? Total well, if you count work. if you count the part time thirty six of them, a lot of changes. I want to ask you first of all a philosophical question. What, Alan, from your perspective, what is or what should be the mission of the student union? I think the mission of the student union should be what's listed as the role of the student union down the front door. We're the living room of the campus. We foster getting together, encourage leadership development. We, like, we feel this is a place that's a neutral area where both anybody can come and debate. The unions were founded from debating societies, mm -hmm. and it was a place you'd come and talk and work out your problems. So this is a place where you can meet and develop and work out your problems. And we're the living room of the campus where you can come and meet and um, uh, work out, you know, relax or meet or work or do whatever you want to. And I think it's a good meeting place, you know, the, over the door on the east side, they got, I'll meet you at the union, and I think that's a good motto. OSU says, howdy, we say, I'll meet you at the union, we got it. Well, you should be, I'll meet you at the student union in the heart of the campus. In the heart of the campus, now that came up with a little, little later mm -hmm. and on, but I think it is kind of the, we'd like to be seen as the heart of the campus. Roscoe Rouse and I got, and he, he didn't like that, he was the director of the library, <laughs> and he says, how can you call yourself the heart of the campus? Because the way that he thought the library was. I said, Roscoe, we can be the heart. We pump the blood. He says, but you're the brains. Well, that took care of him. <laughs> <laughs> Great response. Great response. Uh, I don't know what, uh, you know, over the years, uh, a lot of issues have emerged and changed now. over your time. What, what has changed in terms of uh, of the you know, emerging issues, what is different about the student union, you know, over your 30 some odd years from when you started. Could you share some of those thoughts with us? I think at one time we had, you know, we were the center of the campus, then it kind of grew out ways. And I think now we're looking at the food, looking at the atrium and so forth that we're being recognized by students. <clears throat> I don't know what caused it to kind of slow down, but it did. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, it's, it's swinging back, <clears throat> back to that. More of a student emphasis. I think that. I don't know who's good. Mitch had enough. They're doing a great job of putting the story out now that we never we never did very much of. And I think that they're doing a great job of I think one of my disappointments, or not it was a disappointment, but my <clears throat> problem I've always had with, I never felt like that we were here for faculty, staff, and guests. And I never felt like much many of the faculty knew or felt the student union was useful in terms of educating the students. Mm -hmm. And we always felt like we were useful, in, mm -hmm. but we never got that kind of recognition from many of the faculty. You never heard it because there's always somebody complaining about the bookstore being stealing from the students and all this kind of stuff. And it was always that kind of negativity stuff. But um, I think maybe I mean, we still have those issues as recently as last year, but it's sort of an annual event. But uh, I think. People see us more uh, more warmly now than we did 10, 15 years ago. Is that what you're asking? Mm -hmm, sure. Mm -hmm. And so I think on, they may be on the right track. On on. What have been uh, looking back, uh, Alan, in your, again in your years? What have been some of the major accomplishments, major events that you recall in the life of the student union? In the last one. In, during your your tenure, oh, during time, what would have been major events that you recall? Major, major milestones, major accomplishments. You know, we had so many events. You know, we had so many things happen. It's very difficult to uh, come up with a major event that um, we were involved in because a lot of mine were the daily stuff. You, you when it was over, at five, you know, that night it was over with. Mm -hmm. uh, major events. Um, for example, different renovations, different uh, when Holly Slossy was on the campus when he was in the Yeah, LP, he was here before I was. Key things. <laughs> you know, some and Truman was, here, Truman was here before I was. Mm -hmm. um, but we've had, you know, we used to have these big conferences, you know, we have 4-H uh, <clears throat> conferences and mm -hmm. they've kind of moved to the other side of the campus, but Rainbow Special Olympics has been a big, a big one, I think. That, 
we've enjoyed. And, uh, oh, of course, my big favorite is the Madrigal Dinner, which I was director of for 25 years. That's been kind of a camp, a gift to the city for, and it's still going, which I'm absolutely amazed. Joe has done a good job of keeping it going. And very few programs go that many years. <laughs> well, that was pretty much under your direct supervision, wasn't it, uh, Alan? It wasn't. Uh, that was under your direct supervision, the Madrigal program? Well, I didn't run fast enough. Bruce Twinhoffel brought that to the OSU and Hoover mm -hmm. Fisher. Mm -hmm. And Bruce got together and got the concept going. And I, uh, they asked, I said, well, I'll do the sets for it. Mm -hmm. So I did the first half of the sets. Mm -hmm. It looked like it was pretty good. We did the rest of the sets the next year. Mm -hmm. And I cannot believe they've lasted almost 30 years. <laughs> we just put them together and uh, that's it been fun. But I got it, was able to get involved. Um, then you know, after the second year, Bruce decided to leave and they decided to uh, have theater department do it. And Vivian Locke uh, directed it. And I guess it just tore theater department apart. They, they wanted to get out of it the next year. So Alan, <laughs> so I didn't know anything about it. I, uh, Bruce had left. I found the book he had that had little instructions on how to do a magical dinner. So I looked at that, read it, thought I can write better script than this. And I started writing the scripts and the rest is history. I, I didn't, so I was learning music from Hoover and later on Jerry McCoy. So I learned about music. I learned about scripts. I learned about direction. I got Sam, Sandra Williams to help me choreograph. And we put together a good team, and it's still going. So, and you, you worked with the uh, Alumni Association Hall of Fame induction. Or you worked with Seth oh yeah, I worked with and all the inductions, and mm -hmm. we had graduation ceremonies here. We've had many, many banquets of, with notable mm -hmm. people here. I think that some of the occasions. Did we talk about the ballroom? Uh, mm -hmm. One of the cool <laughs> early student union stories, and I think that needs to be remembered in terms of Hesser's military thoughts. The ballroom waitresses, when we had a ballroom function, would march in, in step, carrying their trays. They had their black uniforms, little lace caps. They'd walk in and go to their tray stands and wait, and it was a procession that was just really sharp. And then when they, they would serve their thing, and when they left, They'd all march out the same way. And they'd always have a big, huge ovation for that. That was always a high point in the banquet time. And, you know, this was, that was that was cool. Uh, kind of one of the traditions that I don't think you could ever re restore. <laughs> and, and your point is it was, it was one time the catering and the events hosting the ballroom were much more formal probably than, than we Much more formal, today. yeah. We've had many events in there. We, if you remember the old Luau's when we have Pat Davis up and she'd dance the, the uh, Tahitian dance and we'd make the volcanoes and mm -hmm. take all the pillows off the end cushion. We'd sit on the floors and have great food, many, much food we'd make. Well, you're kind of going to an area that I want to go a little bit, Alan, in terms of just let, let your, your kind of mind wander through the water. So just some of your favorite memories, you know, special moments that you recall in, in, in the time you worked with the Student Union. You know, that's really hard to, to so, many, so many of them. I mean, sometimes you feel good. I mean, sometimes you feel good, yeah. And there were little things, you know, it's little personnel things, little things. I, I don't know about events that I get tie, tied up and I hadn't thought about it that way. I read your question and mm -hmm. Henry thought about it that way mm -hmm. as a huge event, you know, I think. And so I'm sorry. I, I just had many little personal encounters along the way and did different, different things. Can you share some of those just things that they give you pleasure I and mean, that you enjoy that you look back and think, yeah, this was part of the job. It was fun. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Well, I was sitting in the ballroom the other night at a party mm -hmm. and just thinking of all the, making a list of all the things that I could remember from the ballroom. You know, just that one room. Then you turn around, we talked a little bit ago about the council room. I can remember all the crazy things in the council room. So every room here has some memories. I think one of my, as far as my renovation, some of my efforts in terms of my frustrated architecture career is um, 
One of my favorite jobs that we did is the uh, Alumni Centennial Lounge and the uh, handicap access to the theater. Mm -hmm. That was that took a lot of work to get that down and get it done, and it was almost all done in house. Mm -hmm. And I'm really proud of that area. And it's that's about 15 years ago or so, and it still looks pretty good. So, uh, so those those areas, the ballroom renovation and Oklahoma room, and I think they've been through a couple since <laughs> since then. But uh, we were able to do a lot of that in house and. Uh, at reason. Oh, and I guess one of the major ones is the the summer we did the hotel and bookstore renovation. You know, we did for two point eight million dollars the hotel and the bookstore renovation using in house people. And what we gave to the hotel was we we gutted out all the old H HVAC systems and put in a Cadillac air conditioning system. And we didn't have enough money for wallpaper, so we painted the walls again. Well, <laughs> I don't think they ever realized when they did the when the, the Atherton's made their donation that they they inherited a place that just needed to be decorated. And I think they I am amazed and pleased with what they have done with it. But um, those are some of the things. That, in the bookstore they're just now getting ready to renovate, and mm -hmm. that's been a long time to go to to go on one one run, run renovation. Mm -hmm. And I think it needs it. <laughs> I mean, you talked about earlier uh, some of your special memories too, some of the students that you worked with. Uh, do, can you give you know, some stories? You remember some individuals that that uh, jump out at you that you think about that you worked with that you you saw them grow and develop. You mentioned you know, Kevin Conway. Oh yeah, was, when I worked with this way, be we been just looking at a poster down there, and I was thinking, you know, how about these? Uh, Brady Hunt, you know, was one of our HRA president. He played a good uh, banjo. Well, Brady has gone on to law school and is a lawyer in Oklahoma City, and he runs the banjo, he runs the banjo get together in Guthrie every year. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Ivo Gregory uh, was one of my SUAB people, mm -hmm. and Ivo is back, and I, he is now through a series of jobs around town, is now with a, a Greek system here in the student, back in the student union, mm -hmm. and um, Luke Altendorf was one of our plant managers. He. Is a director of a union at uh, Texas uh, A and M, mm -hmm. I believe, and uh, Ellison Beasley, I think we talked about, and uh, the students. Um, it just you know many times. It's, that's why it's fun to come back to homecoming because somebody will come, Mr. Redding. You know? <laughs> 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 Did you hope you can remember their name? But I do. <laughs> I don't know what uh, you touched on this earlier, but maybe again, why is a student so important to to the university? Why is it important, why is it to, the so university? important to the university? When recognized as such, it is the living room and the front door mm -hmm. in many cases, and the part that people come to first, and it is the warm spot mm -hmm. that's available here. That's hard to do in a classroom. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's hard to do uh, in, in, the, in the other parts of the university. Libraries are doing that. I mean, putting, you put a snack bar in a library, and mm -hmm. many of the colleges now have a little uh, mini lounge, you know, and they're, they're taking it out. But I think as far as the total campus, uh, <clears throat> our role, I think, is um, to um, supplement the education uh, educational process while students are here mm -hmm. through programs and offering them something new to see. I'm very <clears throat> pleased. We've never been a, been a very big art supporter. Mm -hmm. I, when I was there, we had a lot of art shows and so forth. I bring them in and they're pretty easy to get, but it's never been a part of a big program. And I think in the new, in the new, new union, there is an art gallery. Mm -hmm. And I think students walking through and seeing something a little different, uh, it, it kind of helps them see things, maybe not just there, but other places. It kind of opens your mind to be a little more uh, flexible and open. And I think we should provide those opportunities <laughs> for students to um, create, develop, and uh, be be more than you when you leave than you were when you got here. Is that kind of what you're looking for? It is, and a sort of follow-up question to that is alumni are really uh, loyal to the student union you hear. I mean, they're really passionate about the student union. Why, why do you think that is? I think if they, were, if they got involved in the mm -hmm. student union, they had lots of staff support. Mm -hmm. I think our staff was really good about working with, good working with students. Mm -hmm. And this is where they could dig in. And I think 
students develop at different times, and you the, a lot of them in high school they're president of the student organizations work, but when they get to, a lot of them haven't been. Mm -hmm. When they come to campus, <coughs> this is their opportunity to develop those skills, and they come in with a little staff staff assistance. They can they can run a club, and they can you know, we help them do the or we help them organize a club, or help them do all this kind of stuff, and put on some programs. Well, this is invaluable when you get out and need to make a presentation to your boss. You'll have a little skit, have done that before sometime. Mm -hmm. So I think this is, it's that type of thing. It's those type of things when you're involved here, I think it become important in the, in the what they call the other education mm -hmm. while you're at OSU. So the education outside the classroom right. experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And has, and what are some of the things that the student union Alan, you're, in your mind over the years have done in terms of activities for students outside the classroom? I mean, other than coming for a cup of coffee or well, a meal? Let's say, I think one of the, well, this is one I'm kind of proud of. Uh, we did a co-op, one of my first, we did the Will Rogers Film Festival. The first time, first Will Rogers Film Festival that ever happened. One day I said, you know, we don't know anything about Will Rogers. I wonder if we should have a Will Rogers Film Festival. So we got with our group and contacted the Will Rogers Museum and, and found out what all we needed to know about doing a film festival uh, to do one. And we put together Will Rogers Week, and we printed up all kinds of uh, little stickers, and mm -hmm. that was a big deal back then. And um, <clears throat> had the movies set up, and we had uh, silent movies. We got Margaret Nichols, who was a piano uh, faculty here, and had retired. And so we had silent movies, and she played the silent movie. She played the piano for the silent movies. Tiny piano in the background. And it was wonderful. <laughs> and. At one point, there was a chase scene, and she started doing the chase scene before it came up on the screen. I asked her about that. She says, "Oh, I remember." <laughs> so it's it's a it was a great time. Uh, but anyway, at that time, Will Rogers Jr. found out we were doing this and asked if he could come. So Peter Rollins and I had worked this program up. Will Rogers Jr. came to that, and so uh, he he met with the student. He, came for this showing and talked to the people there and told them about making of that movie. His job in that movie was to had chalk to put on the rope on the rope so they'd show up in the film. That was his job in that movie. And so <laughs> and Will Rogers come through. If you've never seen Rope and Fool, you've got to this is absolutely amazing. But that was his job. So this is really interesting the students is from us. I think this, you learn about movie making, you learn about the celebrities, you learn about Roger Rogers himself. He was more than, well, Rogers was a very broad person. And um, so then we called the middle school and said, we had some time, we didn't know what to do with it. Called Mr. Mills and said, hey, we got Will Rogers Jr. here, can you get an assembly together? So we went down to the middle school and showed it to half of the kids. The whole thing full of the other, and he talked to them down there. So I think this type of thing, bringing people in, showing them, you know, I think this rubbing with the students in a small way will open up for a few people. And I think you, if they don't go, they know what's happening. And I think that's good too. Think about, we talked about the directors and, and obviously, you, you know, they're more prominent and you know the names, but who are some of those uh, quiet heroes that you work with? Department heads, different people, worked here for several years and can you share? In the old time, oh yeah. yeah. This is my edu. Mm -hmm. These are the people who educated me. <laughs> hey, Bessery was one as, as an educator. Robbie Robinson was the uh, chief engineer here who had uh, <clears throat> been with the building that was being built and knew every nut and bolt and air conditioning unit in the key, in the building, in the old building. Robbie was a great instructor. Emil Jaffick uh, was a great, uh, he was in engineers, but knew he had been in the Army as a, one of these people that made the made the demonstration models for training, and he could do Emil could do anything mechanical. I mean, just anything. And uh, Paul Kinneman, who was a painter, a professional painter, he knew everything. Uh, taught me all about that and wallpaper. And and uh, Paul was a great teacher. Uh, Chris Tinker uh, in food. 
she had, she had, uh, had a degree, but she came back from Mary had worked for Marriott for several years. Came back here in food production. And she had very creative in food and so forth. Uh, Baker Borkarni, long time friend. Baker was good at um, putting together the overall scene. Uh, what position did Baker have here? Well, Baker was a food manager mm -hmm. at, at one time. Mm -hmm. And he moved on to become a, a director of the hotel and restaurant right. uh -huh. school. Right. He went from here to uh, hotel and restaurant school director. That's right. After Mr. McAllister. Uh, in the student union, I'd say Alice Richardson taught me more about accounting mm -hmm. than I ever wanted to know, but I, it was extremely helpful. Um, Bill Hunter was the um, rock of the <laughs> foundation of the bookstore. He was no veteran, but he he ran a good he had an excellent ship, had a lot of respect. And Winslow Billy, how could I forget him? Winslow hired hired me. I came in at Abe's Abe's Abe's. Uh, but Winslow was a true teacher and a great friend. And uh, Winslow knew everybody and was involved in a lot of things other than those. he taught us to get get out and around. Um, Oh, well, Mike could go on and on, and I think a lot of staff members. We all learn from each other, and so forth. It was a good. It was good. But those are some of the old ones. Difference. I'm thinking your different eras in you know in terms of society and the university that, that impacted the, the student uh, late you know the late '60s, early '70s kind of radical movement. Can you remember any any uh, instances we had of uh, in terms of? I know there was some some uh, boycott and some. Uh, some racial incidents in the early 70s, but there some events like that that stand out. Oh, I mind. forgot about this. Mm -hmm. One of my one of my jobs is being <laughs> in student student area, and you have to remember this is a different time. Mm -hmm. But they decide to have it wasn't Black History. It was Black History Month. No, it was Black yeah Black History Week or, or month. And so I got a bunch. Of, Alan, you coordinate this. Well, this is, <laughs> and you just don't even, you know, stay, keep them in your end of the building. So I got together with Joe Blair, who's University Food Service, and we got a bunch. We got a bunch of the black students. Uh, Margaret Smith was an English professor, and who was the student leader? The guy who pronounced his name different than. You would read it. Uh, I'll have to think of that sometime. But um, anyway, give him a bunch of bunch of different black students. We got together and we put together the first Black History Week, and we had um, Gwendolyn Brooks, who was a poet from Chicago, and we had an artist who did oil painting from New York. Anyway, we had a really a top. We had we had black historians and black uh, artists and black everybody. And we had a guy, Ron, 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 Ron. Anyway, he was a black panther from Los Angeles and uh, was going to come talk. How can I ever forget that? Anyway, I'll, I may have one of the few surviving copies of the program. I'll donate to the, I'll donate to the, uh, um, yeah, anyway, Ron Karinga. <clears throat> well, this time, if you remember, Mr. Gay was the chief of security, and Mr. Cipriano was the FBI, former FBI person in charge of that. And so we'd, we'd gone into this program quite a bit. And I kept, you know, so Paul Cipriano came by and he said, Alan, do you know what you're getting into? And I said, I don't know. He says, well, that Ron Karenga has a price on his head. And we're con deeply concerned about him coming to OSU. So this is going to be, she says, if he gets out where they can get him, he'll be shot. You know? And so I said, oh my God, what are you gonna do? So I got the, the group together and we talked about it. He says, well, you know, so, you know if you get, you get the support, you know, if we can be supported, we'll go ahead and do this. We'll do it in the field house, and we'll have security and so forth. This is before you had security, as we know it now. And so 
he was going to come in Tulsa like at 10 o'clock at night. And so the students decided they would go pick, they, they were going to go pick him up. And so Paul lines up highway patrolmen to escort them over there and to escort them back, back to Stillwater. And still we, and as far as we know, he was, they were, they figured he, his history was that he would back out at the last minute, but we had no clue that he had backed out. We were all kind of secretly, I think, hoping it would not happen. And so they went over there and he didn't get off the plane. <laughs> so huge sigh of relief. That was the nights, those are nights when you get, the phone would ring at two o'clock in the morning and nobody would be there. I mean, you, this was a crazy time and uh, it's like strange things happened. But during that time, my phone went out. My phone was having trouble here. And finally, I just said, Paul, if you're going to tap my wire, tap my phone, I said, please be, you know, get the thing fixed so it doesn't, so it'll work. So anyway, the phone got fixed. <laughs> so we had stuff going on here. It was, it was, it was an interesting time. And those were, those were interesting times. They really were. But it was a learning experience. And this is where education, uh, this is the way we, we taught a bunch of students on how to, how things work that didn't know of anything. The other funny story of that is that we were going to do soul food. <laughs> we were going to do soul food day. So Joe Blair comes and he <laughs> does his soul food research. And he comes in and he says, well, this is our soul food menu that we would suggest. And so we had collards and we had... I forget what he had tripe and he had all kinds of stuff and these <laughs> and you can turn pale they did <laughs> and they said well we would like to have a modified we ended up with a modified soul food week but it was kind of funny <laughs> so th that's that's one funny part about it but that, I thought that was one of as far as education goes mm -hmm. I thought it was one of our high points it really was and I need to get maybe put that together and if we if we could find Margaret Williams and and those crews, I think he lives he lives in Guthrie or Edmund, the guy. What's his name? It'll come here in a minute. But get some of those leaders back together and discuss that because that would be it would be really kind of fun. We need to do that. Well, you uh, you're talking about the fun side of it. The, 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 I can see the sparkle in your eyes and the smile and the passion. But there's also a lot of hard times in that, and I, I've got to assume your job was a lot of times was 60, 70 hours a week, probably maybe occasion 80 hours a week. How, you know, how did you, you know, I guess my question is... Those were actually last, legendary and some of them the Queen, but... Yeah, how did you last so long? I mean, it was 30 some odd years. It had to be pretty uh, physical, physically demanding, 24 or 7. Well, is that on oxygen now? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> how we last so long? Mm -hmm. We kept in shape. I weighed a lot less at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, we got together. We partied a lot at mm -hmm. that time, which we don't party now. Yeah. Not like we did then. We'd have, you know, really good parties. <laughs> And uh, kept the staff, uh, the staff really, we knew each other pretty well. And uh, so, how do we make, uh, you know, when the water's knee deep in the basement, you just work at it until it's gone. <laughs> and Maybe I'm thinking about there's got to be a, something that, a source of motivation, a source of pride, a source of something that keeps you going when, you know, you other things wouldn't, you wouldn't about the paycheck. You know, that's a, that. that, that's a, that's a, Funny thing, you, uh, I hadn't never thought about that until I read your questions. But um, I think the overall thing that really kind of keeps everybody going is your sense of purpose on the campus. Mm -hmm. That we knew we had a reason for being here and we did it. I think that just having that sense of purpose was, uh, was good. I mean, that was really why you knew you were wanted, you knew you were needed. And we knew we were doing something worthwhile. Tying in the same kind of question, I can conclude with this question. Looking back on your, your career, Alan, uh, how, do you, how do you hope people remember Alan Redden? How do, you, how do you hope they'll remember you? Funny thing you mentioned that. When I retired mm -hmm. in 1995, I think it was, mm -hmm. They had probably one of the nicest retirement parties that I ever remember. In fact, your pictures in the book. You were there. Okay. Yeah. And people wrote letters. And Billy collected them and put them in a folder. And I took them home. 
And I don't remember ever reading them. Until the other day I was getting stuff out and I was reading those letters and it just almost made tears here. I mean, it was, I had a stack of letters that thick from different people on the campus, both in the, all around the campus and from all eras. Even Dr. Kahn wrote me a handwritten full page letter remembering stuff. And so in many different ways, but I think a lot of times I had the fortunate position of being in here, being the first one people came to, but they, Apparently, if they'd see me, they could get anything, get stuff done. Mm -hmm. And I always thought that was my job, mm -hmm. <laughs> is to get, if people needed something, we'd be take care of it. Mm -hmm. And apparently I was recognized for that. And I think that it's a pretty good thing to be recognized for. So even if it wasn't my department, I'd go get it done. If we had an information desk. Our policy was if people would call and ask questions and we couldn't answer them. We'd take their number, we'd find the answer and call them back. And eventually the switchboard would just send those questions to, uh, <laughs> to us. And we were looking up phone numbers anyway. Uh, we got that, but uh, we always had, we had the reputation of being the answer, a uh, place where you could get an answer mm -hmm. or get things done. Take off your modesty cap for just a minute. I want to add on to your comments. What do you, what do you think you, you added, you know, sincerely, what, what did you, bring to the mix and I realize it's a team effort but what did you bring to the union you think that helped help continue the legacy and, and build it? To take it off my modesty cap my attitude was you can do anything you want to mm -hmm. and my attitude also was I don't ask permission unless I think I have to <laughs> <laughs> if I don't want no for an answer then you go ahead and do it uh, you may want to say, that, that was my management style and actually, I tried to be pretty sane about most things. And, but I think as far as teaching staff and teaching students and so forth, you decide what you want to do, come up with a plan, figure out who all you need to involve in it, and do it. You know, it, it and they, you know, Nike stole my motto, just do it. <laughs> but uh, we, we did. It was, it was an attitude that we, if we decided we wanted to do some kind of a theme banquet, we researched it and did it. We just did it, and it doesn't take much, you know, you just figure out how to do it and do it. So it's easy. I, I may be able to read into the answer to this question, but I'm going to conclude this question. You had 30 some odd years to do it. What would you do differently? What would you do the same? What would I do differently? In your career here at the student union. My career? Well, you know, the easy answer would be I'd probably get my master's and go on up. I always felt totally comfortable being number two man. I, I liked that position because you didn't have all the guff, but you were able to be creative and you're able to actually work with actually work with the project, which was more of my style. Um, so I might uh, have got a few more class hours, but I, uh, I kind of learned with all of my background hours. I have 235 hours on my bachelor's. So I have a fairly well rounded How many background. <laughs> two hundred and thirty. Two twenty or two thirty, it's a bunch. <laughs> Undergraduate hours? Mm -hmm. Wow. That's well now record. Probably fifties or Fs in math. But, <laughs> 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 but uh, my background is pretty varied. Plus when I came in I brought mm -hmm. some with me when I started that. So what would I do different? Um, I'm not sure. I married well. I had a good I had a good bunch of kids, and I enjoyed my students. I enjoyed the staff for the you know along the way. So I would just hope that I could come into a similar situation if I could do it over. That's you know that doesn't show a lot of creativity, but if I could really do it all over. I would find somebody to teach me how to do math. I would take engineering and I would be an architect. And being a frustrated architect, I have a lot of, a lot of paw prints around this building that shows <laughs> what you can do if you study catalogs and meet the salesman. And I appreciate it very much.